How many of you follow our church at all on our Facebook page occasionally? And look, a few hands up. If you have been following, or perhaps you've read this in the Adventist Review magazine that came out the first of the month, but starting this last Wednesday, January 11th, which is a very cool day, by the way. Anybody know what's so special about January 11th? What's that? (laughs) It's a work day. Oh, there's a few people do. That's when my wife had the privilege of marrying me. Or did I meant to write that the other way around? I had the privilege of 31 years now. How can that be? Somebody 42 years old can be married 31 years. The math just doesn't add up, does it? She robbed the cradle, what can I say? But January 11th was also a big day because it began, if you're following along on Facebook, and maybe Maya could tell us, Myra, what happened on January 11th? It was the beginning of what? Yeah, 10 days of prayer. The North American Division and the General Conference determined that beginning January 11th, this past Wednesday, it was 10 days of prayer for the worldwide church. Now, they're not the only ones that were doing that. I know for the materials we're going through on Thursday evenings in our Bible study, um, the FAST program, they also had 10 days of prayer that began the very first day of the new year. Other denominations also have periods of time when they're praying. Now, all of them are different programs to a certain extent, and they have maybe a little different Bible lesson that goes with each day, but the emphasis is on praying. But there is one word that is common to all of these seasons of prayer, one thing that we as a church are to be praying for. Can you guess what that might be? Starts with R. I will give you a hint. Revival. This is, I don't know, I think the fourth or fifth year now that the GC has had this special 10 days of prayer at the beginning, praying for revival in the church. Now, revival is one of those words, spiritually, that can be good in a sense, but also bad in a sense. The good part of revival is the word itself means to bring life back, give life, energy, and strength to something. And we would all think that is a good thing to have more life, more strength, those kinds of things within the church. But along with revival and the need for life comes the fact that if there's a need for more life, more vigor within the church, then there must be what in the church at this time? Why are we praying? Well, there is a lack of life. I don't want to say dead. That's a very harsh word. Um, But the sense within leadership in the church is that we need to have what pumped into us? Life. Now, one thing that I have learned and God continues to teach me is that I can't make decisions or determinations about others and where they are at. I can only do that for my own heart. And so this morning I would ask you, as not only individuals but as a church family, do you think it is a worthy thing that we are praying for revival within the Adventist church. Okay, I hear a few, lots, quite a few yeses and so forth. Let's narrow that down. Do you believe that praying for revival for us in this place today is a good thing? So, the fact that we, as a majority, I think pretty much all of us said yes, believe that, means that true revival isn't something that happens because the North American Division or the General Conference says it has to happen. 
This isn't Pastor Jim coming to you today and saying you need to be revived because you're dead. Evidently, in our hearts, we all sense a need of what? Of revival. Or you thought if you didn't answer yes, the pastor would see who didn't answer yes and say, well, yes, you do. Well, I won't do that. I'm just going to assume that your heart, like mine, senses that we do need something more in our life spiritually. We need revival. And it is worthy to pray for. If you haven't seen it on the Facebook page, we're on day three or four now. You can dive in, and I know God will hear your last six or seven days just as much as if you had prayed ten. And we can pray for a revival. But for today, we are going to turn to a revival message from God's Word, Isaiah chapter 58 in your Bibles. And I need to revive my eyesight before we go any further here. Isaiah chapter 58, page 735 in your pew Bible if you're following along there. Isaiah chapter 58. This is the only place we are going to be in Scripture today. You don't have to turn one page either way unless Isaiah 58 stretches to more than one page in your Bible. This is where we're going to be. A message of revival from who? This is from God through his prophet Isaiah. And as we're going to see as we begin here, it is a revival message many believe is literally pointed to us today as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Let's begin by reading verse 1 together here. Isaiah 58, 1, by together you can read along. You don't have to read out loud. Uh, Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a what? What does it say? Like a trumpet. Now this word is key to where this passage goes. The word trumpet there in the Hebrew is shofar, which is the ram's horn, which was something that was used to to signal when it was blown to draw God's people to come together. One of its main purposes was to be blown for the feast festivals or ceremonial days where all Israel was to come together. There were several of those that we know that they celebrated throughout the year. Now, where this becomes important to us as Seventh-day Adventists, as we go on through the rest of the chapter, we are going to see that God addresses the religious activity of fasting in particular. Now, when the ram's horn was blown and Israel came together for one of these feast festivals or ceremonies, there was only one where God required the people to fast. Anybody know which one that was? It was the Day of Atonement. And so right now, right off the bat, God gives us a clue that God is speaking to a people who believe in what? An atonement message. Now this chapter is bookend, bookended by two of our major beliefs. You go to the end, which we will come to, verses 13 and 14, and you will see God is specifically talking to his people about what? What does it say there? It's a Sabbath. A people who follow an atonement message and believe in what? In the Sabbath. Is there a people today who hold these truths as part of their beliefs? Well, if you don't know, then maybe you should go get your baptismal certificate and re-look at those doctrinal things that you agreed to when you were baptized. Because those are doctrines of 
the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, whether God was telling Isaiah these words specifically for us today, and that is the only reason, uh, God and Isaiah know a whole lot better than I do. But there are many theologians within our church and also outside, as we will see, that believe that at the very least this is a message for the atonement and a message for the Sabbath, and so it is one that is important for us today, and we will see that as we go through. But nonetheless, God is calling them to raise their voice, and then as we continue, it says, declare to my what? My people, that their Re- declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. Okay, this is the tough part of revival, isn't it? Because God is telling us revival is, yes, giving new life, but there's a reason that new life is given. There's a reason it is needed, and that is because God's people, he says, as he draws them together, he says they're in rebellion and what? and sin. Verse 2. For day after day they what? Seek me out, and they seem eager to know my ways. As if they were a nation that does what is right, and has not forsaken the commands of God. They ask me for what? What does it say? For justice or just decisions. Again, if we look at atonement language and what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, isn't there an element of judgment that comes with the Day of Atonement? There is, isn't there? And what are God's people asking Him for here? They are asking God to be what? Just, to bring justice. And they seem eager for God to come near them. Now it's important that we understand verses 1 and 2 together because this really tells us something important about God's people and perhaps about you and I today if we indeed are in need of revival. Because God says of his people they are in rebellion and in what? and in sin. But does it seem like after we read verse 2 that they realize that or recognize that? No, if you read verse 2 outside of verse 1 and leave verse 1 out of it, you would assume God's people are what? They're in the place that they need to be. They're seeking after God. They're seeking justice as if they had followed God's commandments all along. Could it be that God's people religiously are doing everything they can to be righteous, and yet at the same time they fail to realize that they are in rebellion and sin. Could it be that their perception of what God is truly wanting in their lives is a bit off. Their focus is maybe on the wrong thing. And therefore, even though they are acting very religious, being very religious, God looks at them and says, come here, you guys need to gather together and listen carefully because you are in rebellion and sin. Spiritually, they think they are alive, and yet God might be telling them they're closer to being dead than they are alive. Do we see that anywhere else in Scripture when we think of the end of time and God's people and His church? End of Revelation 3 and the seventh church of Laodicea is a similar message, isn't it? They don't realize their condition. Let's continue on, verses 3 through 5. Again, this is God's speak, people speaking back to him here. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? 
Now, is it a good thing to humble and to fast, to be humbled and seek humility and to fast? It, it would appear, again, that they're doing all the right things. Yet on the day of fasting, you do as you please, God says, and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fist. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fasting that I have chosen only on a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only bowing one's head like a reed? or for lying on sackcloth and ashes, is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? We read these verses, and and it mentions fasting in particular, but I would tell you today that the fasting really recognizes their religious acts. Are they working hard at being religious? They are. And I don't think God is necessarily condemning that because somewhere in their hearts they're doing that for a reason somewhere there is some small part of them that is wanting to be pleasing to who to god and yet their perspective their focus is a little out of whack because god is saying your religion everything that you're doing is only leading to things that aren't very godlike at all. Strife and quarreling and turmoil within his people. Do we see that in God's people today? Do we see it here within our church? Sometimes revival is a hard thing to talk about, isn't it? Because it is a good thing in the sense that God is promising in revival to bring new life, to restore life. But sometimes to go through that process, we have to recognize our true condition. We read through here. We have to ask ourselves the question. Is our perspective in our hearts here today? Is our focus just a little bit off? Could it be we're doing a lot of religious things, trying to be very religious, and yet somehow God is asking us to come together and listen to his voice? Because the religion that we are practicing isn't in line with where he wants us to be. It's not truly the religion he's seeking from our hearts today. Could that be possible? That our perspective, that Pastor Jim's perspective, is just a little bit off today. And that the need for revival is because God is trying to to get me to see, to have the right perspective of what religion really is all about. Dwight Nelson, in his book, The Eleventh Commandment, which talks about Jesus' commands in the New Testament over and over again that are written, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your neighbor as yourself. In the foreword of that book, he includes a letter that was actually written from a young girl who was attending college. Started out, Dear Mom and Dad, Sorry it has been so long since I wrote you last, but all of my stationery was burned up when the dormitory burned down. I'm out of the hospital now, and the doctor says that soon I should be able to have my sight fully restored. Don't worry about where I'm living, because I'm living with this guy named Mike. He's the one that rescued me out of the fire. 
he comes from a really, really super good family. And so you'll be glad to know that sometime in the next year or so we're going to be married. And since I know you guys have been waiting for grandkids, you should also know that you will be grandparents somewhere around the first of this next month. Signed with the daughter's name. Actual letter that was written home. Now, if you're the parent, I know if I'm a parent, and that's one of my daughters writing home from college, I would be on the first plane to Lincoln. There at the bottom of the page, a P.S. Mom and Dad, none of the above is true. But what is true is this semester, I got a D in French class and an F in chemistry. The above was written so that you would have some perspective about what that really means. Now that young lady probably got an A++ in creative writing, right? She might even be a preacher today. But if we stop and think, in comparison to what she wrote in the story, is there some perspective to an F and a D on a report card? There is, isn't there? And sometimes in this life, it is easy for our perspective to get out of kilter. And I believe that like that daughter, even though she is being very unfactual and leading up to what she wanted to say, and God in Isaiah 58 is being very factual with us, I believe the message to us really is the same as we read it here in Isaiah 58. God is shouting this out. He is calling us to come together as a people, and he wants to tell us that I realize, I understand that you're trying to do the right things. I understand you're trying to go the right direction, but your perspective is out of whack. You don't really realize what true religion is. And so let me tell you, now that you know where you need revival at, let me tell you what true religion really is. Verses 6 through 11 now in Isaiah 58. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? What is God about to tell us? He's about to tell us what real religion should look like. To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see him naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and I will say and he will say here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, and you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden like a spring whose waters never fail. Now, can you see a hint of revival in those promises? Not a neat thing to stop and think about in our darkness. We will have now what? Light. That the glory of God will go before us, beside us, behind us. 
that our lives will be filled, even though it might seem like we're in a sun-scorched world, that we will be filled with the living water of Jesus Christ himself. That verse reminds me back to John 4, where the woman at the well, remember the promise to her? Remember what happened to her life when she reached out and took that living water? Turned her and a village upside down, didn't it? There was revival there, wasn't it? Revival because of Jesus and who Jesus is and the message of Jesus. And I think Jesus has just shown us, God has just shown us who Jesus really is and what the religion of Jesus really looks like. Is there a difference between verses 3 and 5 and the fasting in verses 6 through 11 and what God is telling his people real fasting looks like or real religion looks like? In verses 3 through 5, who does it appear that God's people are concerned with, first and foremost? Only themselves. They're fasting and doing all of these religious things in hopes that God will do what? Bless them. Give them the desires of their heart. Bring justice into their lives. Verses 6 through 11, the focus totally changes, doesn't it? No longer are they looking at themselves. They are now looking where? At others. And isn't it interesting, when we are looking to the needs of others, we tend to forget what? The selfish needs. When we're looking to the needs of others, perhaps we tend to not see so much in those around us the things that cause the malicious talking and the fighting and the things that God said were being caused as a result of them seeking religion in and of themselves away from God's plan, from being out of whack with their perspective. Think of this as we are entering this new year and read through the promises that are there. That your light will break forth like the dawn, verse 8. That healing will come quickly. Not just physical healing, relational healing, spiritual healing. The glory of God and His righteousness going before, before you and behind you. You will call on the Lord and He will answer. You will cry for help and He will say, Here I am. Your light will shine in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Verse 11, The Lord will guide you always and satisfy your needs. You'll have that living water. If we were assured that 2017, in our hearts and in this church, that would be what God blessed us with. Would we be satisfied with 2017? Wouldn't that be glorious to experience all of that in our lives as we look at this next year? That's an incredible picture that God is laying before us. But those aren't just things that are out there. Those are promises. That is God telling you and I today, if we understand and practice in our lives the true religion of Jesus Christ, this is what the result will be. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And perhaps it is a little bit different than where we find ourselves today. Even though we may not fully recognize it. I want to go to Matthew Henry's commentary on the Old Testament, and this is where he's going to narrow Isaiah 58, even though Matthew Henry wrote back in the 1800s, even though he wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist. He is going, actually the 1500s rather, he is going to narrow the focus of God's message to a place where we see that perhaps God indeed is speaking to us today. He takes us briefly to the end of the chapter when he says great stress was always laid upon the due observance of the Sabbath because by keeping that day in honor of the Creator, they distinguish themselves from the worshipers of the gods that have 
not made the heavens and the earth. But then listen to what he says here. The Sabbath is joined here with keeping judgment and doing justice. Now, when we think of atonement language and we think of judgment and justice, I think our minds have lost the true perspective and focus of what God has called us to. We mentioned it in last week's sermon. The gentleman I we were visiting with, the family we were staying with down in Colorado, his words to me that he once considered himself a true blue, dyed-in-the-wool Adventist, but now just an old sinner saved by grace. Not that he had rejected Adventism, but he had come to see that Adventism in and of itself doesn't get him anywhere. And what brought him to this place was all of the friends of his that are his age and older who are dying are on their deathbed who are saying things like, I don't know if I've done enough to be in God's kingdom. I don't know if I'm good enough to be in God's kingdom. Maybe I've done too many wrong things or bad things along the way to be in God's kingdom. And they literally are living their last days with no what? With no hope, no assurance. And he said, I started looking at my own life and that's where I came to the conclusion of. Now, I talked a little bit about the game we went and watched last week and, or two weeks ago, and that was a cool thing. But I will tell you that the thing I am going to remember more than anything else about Denver is not a football game. The thing that is rolling in my mind and has been since I got back were his words. Because I can see that in God's people. There is a lack of true assurance and hope. There is a place where it seems very easy for us to be very religious in hoping that that is going to merit something at the other end. And that is all a part of what we take out of the message of the Day of Atonement. Study it carefully and understand where that judgment is. Study it carefully and understand that it is in favor of the saints in what Christ Jesus did. Study it carefully and understand that it is an invitation for you as God's people not to live the rest of your lives from 1844 on under this cloud or this shadow, hoping that you're being religious enough or good enough to attain something, but rather that date is significant because it is God calling you as ones who have assurance, as ones who have hope, as ones who the judgment has been in favor of to go out to the world and live the character of God to live the righteousness of God, to be a light in darkness. Because if you listen to what he says here, the Sabbath is joined as here, this is Matthew Henry, in keeping judgment and doing justice. And some indeed understand this as the day of atonement. Long before Adventism, almost 200 plus years before Adventism, this man, Matthew Henry, inspired by God, looked at Isaiah 58 and he understood this is an atonement message. This is, an adju- this is a judgment message. This is God telling his people that they've been focusing on the wrong thing. Their perspective has been off. Their religious activity has been headed the wrong direction. And I want them to see that real religion, real justice, The real atonement message is the character of God being lived out in who? His people. And if you think this is out of whack, those words that we just read as far as taking care of those who are in captivity, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, all of those things that we read about this afternoon, we're not going to take time to do it, but I will challenge you to go and read the last part of Matthew 25. 
There it tells us that when Jesus comes, he is going to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep to the right, the goats to the left. That is a picture of what? That's a judgment picture, isn't it? That has atonement written written all over it because we know that determination is made before who returns? Before Jesus returns. And the wording there that follows that, those who are on the right, the sheep, those who are going to be in God's kingdom, are those who have fed the hungry, clothed the naked, released the captives, those who have done unto the least of these, Jesus says, they've done it unto who? They've done it unto me. The language is exactly the same. It too is an atonement message. It is speaking to God's people today and it is telling us this is what my church, this is what my people are going to look like when I what? When I return. They're not going to be busy going through religious motions trying to impress me and somehow scratch and claw themselves to a level of salvation. But no, they have that assurance in their heart. They know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. That isn't a question in their minds. They are so filled with that Holy Spirit we studied about today that Jesus Christ is actually living in their hearts. And therefore, because Jesus is living in them and through them, their lives look a whole lot like who? Like Jesus. And you tell me, you read through the life of Jesus in the New Testament and tell me how much time he spent on religion that looked like the fasting of verses 3 through 5 as opposed to the religion we read about in Isaiah 58, 6 through 11. You tell me what Jesus spent his time doing. The character of Christ will be written all over God's people. And their religion will be one that is like that of Jesus Christ. Well, that's Matthew Henry. He's not even an Adventist. Should we really pay attention to him? How could God inspire anybody who wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist? We better look at some place a little closer to home. Desire of Ages, page 637. An atonement message because it is talking about Judgment Day. Anybody here think Desire of Ages is relevant to us today? Probably in your hearts you are thinking more so than some guy named Matthew Henry. This is what is said there of this atonement message of this judgment day. It says Jesus represented his decision as turning upon one point. How many? It says just one. It says when the nations are gathered before him, there will be but two classes and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and suffering. One point that it is all going to turn on. That's not Pastor Jim. That's somebody that you trust. It is going to turn on one point. And if you are going to be on God's side when it's all said and done, it says you are going to be he who was living, she who was living when Jesus came, a life that was doing what Jesus did when he was here. Now we all know one thing. Pastor Jim or no one else in this room today is going to be saved because I was out feeding the poor, clothing the naked, or doing jail ministry. I can do that 24-7, and it will not get me one hair's width closer to heaven. It does me absolutely no good as far as my salvation goes. So why in the world would we put in a book that it all hinges on one point? 
because that one point is that when I am saved by the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ, when I put my faith in Him, He comes through His Holy Spirit and He dwells here. And when He dwells in here, out here all of a sudden starts to look a lot less like Jim trying to be religious and it looks a whole lot more like Jesus not trying to be religious but truly being religious. And there's a big difference. And when Jesus comes, those with the assurance of Jesus here are going to be found doing what Jesus did himself when he was here. And that's pretty cool to think about. Because real revival is me putting away who I used to be and becoming like Jesus. And God isn't here, and I'm not here today condemning who we used to be and saying, oh, we're all a bunch of bad people. That's not the message here, is it? As I read it, the message is God says, you know what? You guys are trying very hard. There is something in your heart that is wanting to go the right direction. But you know what? I'm pleading with you. I'm calling you together right now. I want to tell you that your perspective is out of whack. You're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at what you can do and what you think needs to happen and what is gratifying self. And I need you to turn your eyes away from that, please, he says. And turn your eyes towards Jesus and look at who he is and what his religion is. And if you will turn your heart to Jesus, if you will put your trust in him, don't worry about your salvation because he's already what? He's taken care of it. And you know what? When we forget and we put aside this part of the old self, this part that a lot of us as Seventh-day Adventists have been raised with because we think we're living in this time of judgment when God is sitting there looking at my every action and I'm worried because I'm not doing enough good things, if we set that aside and just believe what this book says, That if I believe in Jesus, I am saved. No ifs, ands, or buts. If we would accept that from him and allow him into our hearts, we would be transformed and our lives would begin to look more like Jesus. Revival would happen and it begins with looking to Jesus, to living with Jesus. And he will come in here and take care of this. He has promised Pastor Jim that it's not my responsibility to clean myself up or make myself righteous. Jesus did that. And if I will let Jesus do what he has done there, he will do what he wants to continue to do in a transformed life. And we read about it in Isaiah 58. We read about it in Matthew 25. That's what God's people are going to be doing when he returns. Let's look at verse 12 quickly here as we continue on. Isaiah 58 and verse 12, because this gets neat here, cool to us, as we allow Jesus to do what he's wanting to do in our lives. Notice what it says. This is another promise. But I think along with being a promise, it's a calling to us. It's showing us the results of what is going to happen if we have Christ living in us. If Christ is living through us, it says, Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repairer of broken walls or repairers of the breach, the King James says, restorers of streets with dwellings. What does that mean to be a repairer of the breach or the broken down walls? Well, for literal Israel, their temple and their city laid in ruins. And for them, here is a promise that God says, if you turn your hearts back to me, what's going to happen to your city? Be rebuilt. The breach will be repaired. But spiritually, who is the city of God today? We are. 
we are being built into this holy city, this holy sanctuary. It's us. There's a breach to be rebuilt. And it says this here in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. Here is pictured a great work of revival. The practice of true religion. A breach has been made in the wall, as it were, because of the failure to practice true religion. Nevertheless, the foundations remained, and upon them a new structure was to be reared. The manner of rebuilding the old waste places has been set forth in verses 6 through 10 of Isaiah 58. So what is it that repairs that which is broken down? What is it that brings revival? It is the character of Christ being lived out in his people. It is when the love of Jesus starts coming out of our lives in the way we treat one another. It is because we're now looking at each other because we love them, not to judge them, because we want to make a difference in their lives instead of just worrying about who? About us. Barnes's notes on the Old Testament, the world is full of the ruins which sin has caused. And Barnes's notes here brings us to us today. The world is full of the ruins which sin has caused. It is for the church of God to rebuild these wastes and to cause the beauties of the cultivated fields and the glories of the cities to be rebuilt, to revisit the desolate earth. In other words, to extend the blessings of that religion which will yet clothe the earth with a moral loveliness. Now that sounds pretty grand, doesn't it? Look at our world and our earth today. To clothe it again with a moral what? Loveliness. As though sin had not spread its gloomy and revolting monuments over the world. What is God calling His church to do? He's calling this church, you and I, Christ living in us, and through us by the power of His Holy Spirit to go out into the world and live Isaiah 58, 6 through 11. And in doing so, it says it is going to clothe this broken down sinful world with moral loveliness as if sin had never what? As if sin had never been here. Does that even seem possible to you today? Looking at our world? May I remind you of this? What am I without Jesus? I am broken down and hopeless. And yet in Jesus Christ, as my Savior, at this very moment, I stand before God as if I had never sinned. If God can do that to me, Do you think he is big enough to make a difference in the world around us? Doesn't seem possible. But with God, all things are possible. Looking at the time here, but I want to share something with you. Once a month I go out to Park Haven a nursing home care center out in Manhattan and share a devotional with the folks out there. This has been going on, I think, for five or six years now. And about three years ago, a gentleman by the name of Bill and his wife, Margaret, showed up. And right before I do my devotional, the activities director for Park Haven usually is sharing for about a half hour, kind of a what happened on this day kind of a thing, sharing that with people and then events and things going on from the newspaper and so forth. And Bill and Margaret were there and then he said, well, now it's time for Pastor Jim. And I got up and I shared my devotional and and Gordon, which is the name of the activities director there, was talking to Bill and Bill said something like this. This might not be his exact words, but it's the gist. He says, you didn't tell me this was going to be a part of what was going on here. I don't even believe in God. And he really wouldn't have needed to say that because as I was teaching my devotional for them, he had this scowl on his face the whole time. 
But you know what? His wife, Margaret, loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all of her heart. And so every month, faithfully, as she comes to the devotional time, guess who gets to come as well? Bill gets to be there. And I've prayed for Bill because I legitimately don't think he believes in God or he's maybe seen enough of God in the church in the wrong way that he doesn't really want to hear about God anymore. And for three years, I have done devotionals and watched him look down at the ground and act as if that's the last place on earth he wanted to be. But he was there. This last Tuesday, I was sharing a devotional that if you were here the day before Christmas, I shared several stories of what people have done around our country that show the love of Jesus. We're talking about God's love and that being the last of our Advent candles. And shared the story about the gentleman, remember, down in San Antonio, the family that didn't have enough money on the very hot weather to have a swimming pool for their kids. And so they bought a tarp and put it in the back of their truck and filled the pickup bed of their truck up with water. Kids were swimming in there. People started making fun of them, calling them rednecks and all kinds of names because they were poor and didn't have money. And this gentleman saw this on Facebook and went out and bought a pool for them. The love of Jesus. And the woman in Alabama, remember, who hadn't eaten with her and her grandkids for a few days and tried to steal some eggs because they didn't have enough money. They broke in her pocket. She was caught. The police came, and instead of arresting her, the police bought her eggs and then filled her pantries at home with food. The love of Jesus still alive. So I was sharing those stories, the other ones that I shared. And then I read out of 1 John 4, as I had on the day before Christmas, and I read that none of us have seen God, and yet when the love of God is present in our lives, the world literally gets to see who? To see who Jesus is. And when I said those words, a smile came over Bill's face. And he nodded his head, and he mouthed, that's right. That the love of God can still be seen. There's somewhere in that heart of his is a belief and a love in God. And three years of all of my devotionals trying to tell him about God have done not a whole lot, or maybe the Holy Spirit has been working, I don't know. But what got him what made him acknowledge something about God was the love of God and the character of God as it is seen in his what? In his people. And when I saw that, knowing what I was talking about today, I said, you know what? God can do this. God can make a difference in our world because he's made a difference in my life. And he's made a difference in yours. Made a difference in Bill's life. He can make a difference in every life in this world if they truly have a chance to see who? To see Jesus. God's simply telling us today, get your perspective right. Get your focus in the right place. This is the religion I want you to practice. Not just trying to scratch and claw your way up the salvation ladder. Forget about that. Jesus took care of that. Rest in his assurance and get your eyes on Jesus and let him work through you and live in you, in your life. I want to read the rest of the quote that I didn't finish from the Adventist Bible commentary here because it goes on to say the manner of rebuilding the old waste places has been set forth in verses 6 through 10. It consists of a practical revival of practical religion, becoming Christ-like. And notice what it goes on to say. The place of this reformation, where this reformation begins, is found in verse 13. We haven't read verse 13 in Isaiah 58, but let's just do that quickly. Isaiah chapter 58. 
and verse 13. And notice what it points us to as where this begins. If you keep your feet from breaking what? The Sabbath. And from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, verse 14, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord, has spoken. So where does revival, where does it all begin? It's interesting, God brings it down to one place, one day where he has called you and I together. Not once a year atonement, every week atonement where God has called us together to be with Him and to get our perspective back on what? Track. And His Sabbath message to us is not a whole lot different than His fasting message was. Stop worrying, He's saying, about how to make your religion on Sabbath acceptable and go out and start living the Sabbath like Jesus. It's interesting reading Matthew Henry's quotation on this from back in the 1500s. You wonder where we get a little legalistic? My goodness. Some pretty harsh admonitions. But basically, if you read the gist of what he says that I think is important for us today, leave behind when we enter into the Sabbath period of time. Our careers, our ambitions, our selfish desires, our acts of trying to please God by our own righteousness. And Back in the 1500s, he even said, leave behind this thirsting for sporting and recreational things. Do you believe they said that back in the 1500s? That's what he says. And he says, turn your heart back to worship of God. This invitation that God gives us every single week to come and worship Him. Now, when I'm reading Isaiah 58, I don't think God is on the same page with Matthew Henry 100%. Because if he's really wanting us to turn the Sabbath into a checklist of the things we do and don't do that are right and wrong, that kind of looks like the fasting he's telling us isn't worth a whole lot. But on the other hand, is there a place on this one day when if we really are looking at what God gave it to us for, is there a place to leave our careers and our ambitions and our stuff, whatever it may be, to set it aside and truly focus on the true and practical religion of Jesus? And considering the busy lives that we live and how much we cram into every day of the other six days of the week, could it be that Jesus brings us this atonement message and includes the Sabbath because on this day, we really have a chance to go out and practice practical religion and helping those that are in need? I wonder why Jesus on the Sabbath knowing he was going to get in trouble for it, knowing that everybody was going to disagree with him for doing it, went out of his way to do good on the Sabbath and then tells us it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. I wonder if Jesus was trying to tell us something today. I wonder if Jesus was trying to tell us that, yeah, it was my custom to be in the sanctuary on Sabbath, but it was also my custom to go out and live a godlike religion in the world around me. 
And I wonder if it started here on this day that we started thinking about what practical religion looks like in reaching out and not thinking of ourselves and what we can do on the Sabbath day because we've had a long six days and we need this day. But if we took a little time and looked at the world around us and said, how can I live this Christ-like life since He is living in us, right? How can I spread some of that love around today? Is there any way on the Sabbath day that we can be a little more like Jesus and a little less religious? And if it starts on the Sabbath, might that not just spread out into my life the rest of the week? One of the testimonies has an interesting quote. It says, If you are so busy and working so hard that on the Sabbath you do not have the energy or the ability to serve Jesus Christ in the way he has called you, sinning as far as breaking the Sabbath is as much happening on those six days as it ever will be on the Sabbath. Preparing our hearts for this one space and time that God has given us to come together and hear his calling to come away from our religion and turn to his to experience true revival I wonder today in the midst of 10 days of prayer what would happen if all of us starting today on the day God has given us, began to pray earnestly that God would bring a true revival to our hearts, that God would change our perspective, place within our hearts the full assurance of his salvation, place within our hearts his love and his character that it might begin to flow out of us. I wonder if we really begin to seek that, if these promises that we read in Isaiah 58, I wonder if those could be a part of who we are this year. I wonder if revival could happen here. I wonder if atonement revival could happen in this heart. I wonder today if it can happen in our hearts. What do you think? Is it worth praying about? Is it worth turning the Holy Spirit loose? Telling Him to do whatever it takes? Seems to be, seems to me, that it would be worth our while. Not just some program the GC does once a year. Let's make it something that is God happening in our hearts. Programs come and go. Last time I checked, God has been here and will be here forever. Let's make revival start today in our hearts in this place. Let's ask God to change our perspective, our view. Turn us to the religion that is really of Jesus living in our hearts.